Google's former VP of AI, Mustafa Suleiman, was on CatGPT's podcast. So CatGPT is a creator on primarily on Instagram and TikTok. It was really good stuff. Very good at explaining why AI is important. You should definitely follow her. She had a, on her podcast, here we go. Speaking of the CatGPT podcast, she had Mustafa Suleiman, who was a co-founder of DeepMind and Inflection AI. So that's quite a get for a, a podcast guest. So on the conversation, he talked about a product Google had called Lambda and Lambda was quite a while ago. I don't know the exact dates, but it was before ChatGPT. Absolutely. And he talked about Lambda as genuinely like ChatGPT before ChatGPT, but they did not push it. They did not get it out into the world because they were concerned of the existential threat that it posed to Google's own search business. Now, this is something you, if you watch any of my stuff or you read any of my work, I go on about all the time, how Google are in big trouble. About 80% of Google's revenue comes from search. So specifically when you or I go onto Google and we search something, they serve up adverts at the top. So they're not charging their users for the money. So when everyday people use it, we use it for free because we're using it for free. We are the product. We are what they are selling to advertisers. They are selling our eyeballs and our attention not physically our eyeballs, or I hope not. That would be a very strange twist in their business model. Hopefully they won't get that desperate. 80% of their revenue comes from that. It doesn't come from telephones. It doesn't come from Gmail. Gmail was like a cool thing that was created in their extra day of work. It was a side project. It doesn't come from any of those business areas. It comes from search. That is their core business is indexing and cataloging the world's information via Google search. And that includes YouTube. YouTube is basically the second largest search engine, but it just serves up video content. So they make all of their money from that. Artificial intelligence, generative artificial intelligence is a huge threat to that because gen AI is trained on all of the information that is already out there. And it means we do not need to search for information because gen AI can basically create that information by digging into its training for us. So you've probably seen already on Google, they've added the AI overviews at the top. This is kind of them trying to have their cake and eat it because they make their money from everything that is below it. But even they have realized that the new way of accessing information is not searching through websites. It's not going to Google, finding a website, clicking on the website, reading through the information, realizing it's trash information or it's full of adverts or whatever, going to another website, trying to find that information elsewhere. We spend a lot of time searching for information online because there's a huge amount of it. Gen AI cuts through all of that. Yes, it's got things wrong. Famously with AI overviews of Google, it was telling people to eat rocks and eat glue and stuff like that. But this is where we are heading. So previously we used to have to remember all the information. That became impossible. So we started to write it down. And then we had things like encyclopedias. Remember Encyclopedia Britannica? Uh, then we moved to things like Encarta, which was, gosh, that, that makes me sound old, doesn't it? Encarta, which was a CD version of Encyclopedia Britannica, which I think Microsoft released. I think it was Microsoft. And it had all the content of Encyclopedia Britannica on discs, basically, which, so you went from a bookshelf full of information down to a few CDs. And that at the time was like, oh my God, amazing. And then in Carter stopped being relevant because we had the internet we would use the internet to find information. So we've always had changing paradigms of how we access information. The newest one is generative AI It's using AI to find and synthesize information. That is an existential threat to Google because as long as we're not do if we're doing that, we are not going to be searching for it. And Google's 80% of their revenue collapses to zero and Google will cease to exist. So this is why on this, uh, this conversation with Mustafa Suleiman, he basically admitted, yeah, we had something like ChatGPT before ChatGPT. We did not put it out into the world because it would have harmed our search business. They knew upfront many years ago, what a disaster this would be for Google. The thing is, this reminds me of the famous example. You can't avoid it. If you go and get an MBA, like I have the famous example is Kodak. So Kodak were, I think they formed in like the 19th century. They've been around for a long time and they created both, they created film 
film was their main product. So film for cameras and video cameras, not video cameras, film cameras, excuse me. So they'd done this for nearly a hundred years or so. It was one of their researchers who actually worked out digital photography and realized early on, oh, okay, wow, we could do this digitally. We don't actually need to use all these chemicals. We don't need to use celluloid and these physical materials. We can do this digitally. And this guy went up to the head, head of Kodak and he's like, hey, we should be doing this. We could save so much money. People could take so many more photos. They wouldn't have to buy film, etc." And Kodak shut him down. They said, absolutely not. Because Kodak realized digital photography was a threat to their main business, which was creating film. They'd already created factories, hundreds of factories across the globe. They were one of the biggest purchasers of chemicals, the chemicals used in film production. All of that would have been at risk if digital cameras became a reality. So despite it, the, it being their researchers who worked out digital photography early on, Kodak sat on it and they said, nope, we are not touching digital photography. And then later other companies obviously came into the digital space and Kodak was always the one who in their marketing and in their messaging, all they talked about was how superior film was to digital and how superior and how real photographers should use film. They shouldn't be using digital. So they were always on the back foot, always on the defensive. That's the risk for Google here. I think though, what Google are trying to do is have their cake and eat it. They are trying to maintain their search business, but they're placing AI overviews over the top. In already website owners are seeing drops in traffic because people are not going to the websites. People are going to the AI overviews, getting the information and leaving Google. At the moment, Google don't make money from that. They will probably add adverts into AI overviews, or maybe they have already. I don't think they have, but I'm sure they will because they need to make money. What this means though, is this disincentivizes me as a website owner from creating new information. Why would I write a blog or publish recipes or create a, an affiliate marketing site? and put information onto the internet. If Google is not going to send traffic to my website, I will not make money. There is no incentive for me to do. So you start to see a crash out in the number of new websites being created, the content being put online. And this in turn means that it's less likely that people are going to be going to Google at all to find the information and Google will still sink down. This is not just Google's fault. It's just, they happen to be the people who are the gatekeepers to the information on the internet. And that information is now transitioning from search as a paradigm of accessing the information to generative AI. So Google are in an unenviable position. I was actually at Google, got a little thing here, my security pass. I was at Google two days ago. I did not say any of this because I'm sure they all know this and it's a bit of a concern. So I kept stumped. Well, I hope they know it. I'm not sure if all their staff members realize, but yeah, I think Google is in trouble. And this article in this podcast with ChatGPT suggests that they know that generative AI is an existential threat, which is why they sat on Lambda and they did not grab this technology. And instead they allowed OpenAI and ChatGPT to become the leader in this particular space. So. It is what it is. It's a bit sad. It's hard to imagine a world without Google, but I think in the next 20 years, we'll be asking young people, or we'll mention Google and young people will be like, wow, what's that? That's a stupid name for a company. What the hell is Google? Which seems crazy to us right now, but I don't think is, I don't think it's unlikely. But Uzi saying Philips on MP3. Yes. Perfect. So there are so many examples we were talking earlier about google produced lambda and they did not release lambda which was like chat gpt before chat gpt because they were fearful of their search business and i gave the other example of kodak and then a researcher at kodak creating the digital camera not coming up with the idea um, and uzi saying philips on mp3 yeah philips came up with the mp3 standard but because they built cd players and cassette decks and stuff like that. There's no way they wanted a digital format out in the world like that. So they sat on the technology for as long as they humanly could. It happens again and again with large corporations because they have the research teams. They have hundreds, if not thousands of people working on technologies in this space, but they are also the ones with the most risk, the most to lose if they release these technologies. So lots of them will come up with the technology patent it and then sit on it, making sure no one else can use it. 
Yeah. Yay, corporations. Jason saying, Google isn't going to die. They've pivoted pretty well recently. Yep, I agree. They have so to AI models. Yes, they're pushing into AI aggressively because they know the writing is on the wall for the search business. The question is whether they can replace the search revenue with AI because it's a it's 80% of their revenue, which is a huge amount of money, a huge amount of money because Google is a massive business. So the question is whether they are able to replace that with the revenues from artificial intelligence. For example, let's see what OpenAI's revenues are. Or apparently OpenAI's revenue is 10 billion. Google, let's look at the Google search revenue. Yeah, so last year, Google search revenue was 200 billion. So this is the shortfall, the gap that they need to make up. They're making 200 bill, billion from search and another 40 billion from YouTube adverts. Okay, so let's say 200 billion, 200 billion revenue from search. Right now, OpenAI, which is arguably it's a larger AI company, it has more users of their AI products. They doubled their revenue this year to 10 billion. So they went from 5 billion to 10 billion. So that's still, what did I just say it was? 200. So that's still 20 times less than the revenue that Google makes from, from search. So the question here is, okay, yeah, Google have really good products and they just won the math Olympiad. They're doing great things in AI, hundred percent agree. They are 20 times off or 2000% off the revenue target they'd need to hit to replace Google search. So maybe they can do it. I don't know. I don't know how much of that is profit as well, especially if you were building lots of data centers, very expensive data centers, then that's also going to squeeze that revenue down. So the profit of it's going to be much lower than search, which is, I think search revenue is very high rep margin. Let me look it up there. Google search. Okay. So Alphabet's average net profit is 27%, which is pretty good. I don't know. Here we go. So Google's core business, which is search runs on a 75% margin, apparently. Ooh. That's not going to be the same with AI. And so I think this is their big problem right now is we need to replace 200, sorry, 200 million in revenue, 200 million or billions. Are we in them? No, 75% is from advertising. So it's billions. Gosh, the numbers are so big. So they need to re replace 200 billion in revenue. They're probably making 5 billion from their AI products. Maybe I'd have to do the research into that. So how are they going to make up that shortfall? And will that revenue be at a similar profit margin? Probably not because search is at 75, 75% profit margin. This is why I'm quite bearish on Google. And I think they may be in trouble. Jason says the companies are thinking about putting ads in responses. Yeah, Jason. So this is coming back to Google. The AI overviews, so AI overviews, take information from Google and put it at the top and make it instantly accessible, which stops people clicking on the websites, which is a disaster for the website owners, but it allows Google to stay relevant because people are still using Google for now. And right now they're not adding adverts into it, but a hundred percent, they're going to start to add sponsored listings into AI overviews. Let me check that because maybe they already are. I might be wrong on this. Yep. Okay. They are adding ad adverts. Of course they are. <laughs> so Jason has said they're already thinking about putting ads in responses. Yeah. A hundred percent. So they are doing it. I know that Bing, which is Microsoft search engine. Yeah. Search engine. God, that I was about to call it a browser. It shows how much I use it. Do you know they spent millions coming up with the name Bing because they needed a good name so they could combat Google, which is hard because Google owns, God, I think it's 90% of Western search traffic. So they spent millions coming up with this name Bing. And the first day they released it, somebody, some wisecrack online, probably on Reddit, realized that it's an acronym of, but it's not Google. So these poor marketing people had spent months and millions coming up with the name. And then one person in one day was like, oh, no, it's not going to work. Anyway, that's a, that's a side point. So they are adding ads into AI overviews. This was from May, 2025. Shopping ads in particular. Okay. So I know ChatGPT do this as well. I was recently buying, you can't see it, but a guitar up here and I wanted to buy a new seven string guitar and I was chatting to ChatGPT about what are the best seven string guitars within a certain budget for a certain type of music, blah, 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 blah. And it wasn't just giving me suggestions. It was giving me links for where I could buy them. So they will get a cut on that. They'll get an affiliate fee on that. 
and they will also, I imagine, start to do sponsored posts later. Bing also tried this out early days with, it wasn't Gemini back then, it was called Bard, which was Google's AI. Sorry, Microsoft's AI. Even I get mixed up, there's so many of them flying around. And it was very unpopular. But I think what we're seeing now is because all of the AI companies need to make money, they need to put some revenue in, they're going to be moving towards these sponsored searches. How transparent they'll be is still to be seen. This is actually, funnily enough, this is how Yahoo died. This is how Google killed Yahoo because Yahoo got greedy. Yahoo started to put promoted listings at the top. So you could pay to get to the top of Yahoo, but Yahoo would not disclose that it was a paid for listing. So what was happening was trash and sales pages were reaching the top because they'd paid. People were clicking through to it and they're like, oh, it's trying to sell me something. This is nonsense. So people lost uh, faith in Yahoo. And at the same time, Google turned up and they said, no, we would never do that to you. We will we'll always be very clear in our labeling. And they were initially. Early days, Google, the advertised listing, it had a big yellow box around it, it said advert it. It was, it looked totally different. They've become more and more subtle over the years. So now it's like a little kind of gray, it says ad in gray letters on white text. And it's, it looks more and more like the organic listing. So the balance here will be, you want to provide a strong generative AI response, something that's genuinely useful, and then have sponsored listings that are obvious enough so that you don't lose trust with your users, but at the same time, subtle enough that people will still click on those and buy them because this kind of online advertising and AdWords and stuff, it is a little bit about tricking people. Google will never say this, but it is about, they'll say it's about providing a valuable paid alternative at the top of the page or whatever, but no, it, it's about tricking people. Let's be honest. So that's going to be the balance for generative AI companies right now. And I'm sure it will become the norm and they'll all add adverts into their, their listings.